Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second old school lecture. Before we start, please make sure that your cell phones are switched off. Uh, as you might know, February is Black History Month, and Black History Month was founded uh, uh, in the US in 1915 to promote and research the achievements of Black Americans. Although this should be done year round, this dedicated initiative wishes to restate the need to build a more inclusive community. Uh, since 2018, we have Black History Month Florence, which is an association founded by um, Justin Thompson that is engaged in the promotion and production of research and content dedicated to Blackness in the Italian context. Um, today is March 1st, so we are a day late, but we wish to participate this year too to Black History Month uh, celebrations. And it is a great pleasure to introduce our speaker, not really a guest speaker, because he has been with us for the past 17 years more than 17 years, um, my colleague, Jonathan Nelson. Professor Nelson is research associate at Harvard University and co-editor of the Elements of the Renaissance series at Cambridge University Press. He has published extensively on Italian Renaissance art with books and exhibition catalogs on Leonardo, Michelangelo, Botticelli, Filippino Lippi, Claudio Blanelli, and art patronage. In 2021, he co authored and co edited volumes on negative reactions to Italian Renaissance art and representing infirmity, and an article on Christian Ethiopians in Filipinos painting. Uh, tonight, Professor Nelson will talk about Black Africans in European adorations of the Magi the power of the image. When Africans appear in most medieval and early modern images, they play the roles of slave or servant. But numerous adoration of the Magi paintings show one of the three kings as black. Did these kind of images transform the way Africans are seen, were seen or perceived in Europe? This is one of the questions that I think Professor uh, Nelson is join, going to uh, address to answer. Uh, this lecture will last about 45 minutes, then we will have some time for questions and answers, and then a light reception. Please help me welcome Professor Jonathan Nelson. Thank you, Natalia. It's nice to be back here in this spot. And before I uh, plunge into my talk, I just want to say that it is, uh, it's wonderful to be part of Black History Month. It's a wonderful initiative that uh, Justin Thompson has created here in Florence. And in the talk today, I'll be looking at uh, representations of the adoration of the Magi. But what I wanna stress throughout the talk is the importance of physical contact, of actually meeting the other. How that's important for artists, for observers, for us. And before I actually go into the talk itself, looking at these European images, I wanna say a word, if I may, about my own path, how I came to look at this topic and why I think the topic is important. Our story begins um, try it this way. This way. We'll go first. Thank you. So our story begins in the early 1980s in New York City at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And outside the museum, you see Robin Williams, who was then a street performer. And 
If you look at the audience behind him, you see that everyone is white. As you might know, in New York City, there are lots of people who are not white, but they're not here at the Metropolitan Museum. And inside, in the Department of European Paintings, I was an intern. And as far as I recall, everyone who worked there was also white. That is, we had no contact with the people of color who lived in the city and who visited the city. I think that's important. To put it another way, the few people of color who did come, when looking around, they must have seen that there were very, other, very few people like them. And this lack of contact with others made the museum inside and out basically a white ghetto. And it led to what I think is a very erroneous and dangerous view that people who are not white might feel out of place. At the time I was a student at Hunter College and the situation there was much the same. That is, I remember the hearing that the student population was 85% black and Hispanic and that's reflected in the yearbook that you see on the right. At the time Hunter was just one building, 16 stories high. And I remember every morning I'd get in the elevator and it was a large elevator and 85% of the population of the elevator was black and Hispanic and you'd go up and some people get on and some people get off. We get to the top floor and again, it was all white. So the field of art history and museums at the time were almost entirely white. Well, you may be thinking, well, that was 40 years ago. What about today? Surely things have changed. And the reality is not much. Here is the most recent statistic I could find for 2019. And the people who graduated in museum studies in the United States and blacks and African-Americans made up less than 4%. And I'm sure that those who went on to get jobs were overwhelmingly employed in the departments of modern and contemporary art and in African art, but not in the European paintings department of various museums. There are some positive signs here in Florence. There's an association called Amir. And as their slogan says, it's where immigrants serve as ambassadors of the cultural patrimony of Italy. Most of these immigrants are from Africa and they give uh, tours in Italian, in Fiesoli and in Florence. Uh, and it's a very good organization. People could start seeing Africans um, as being, or, and, and not only, as being ambassadors of this world of art that we're studying here. Another positive sign is the Renaissance Society of America. Just a couple of weeks ago, they announced that for the first time, the vice president is a black scholar, a distinguished black scholar. I'd like to point out though, that he is a historian, not an art historian, because in the field of art history, not much has changed since when I was a student in this seven year span up to a couple of years ago, again, Africans, African-Americans and Blacks made up less than 4%. And once again, I'm sure that nearly all of them study African art, including Egyptian, um, as well as modern and contemporary, but not the subject of my talk this evening. Let me give you a practical example. There's a wonderful online exhibition, which I encourage you all to, to check out. It's free, it's on the Uffizi website. It's called On Being Present. And it was organized by Black History Month Florence and the curator, Justin Thompson, is also the founder of that association. And in it, a number of scholars of various fields from various countries investigate some well-known and some obscure paintings and why black figures are there and what roles do these black figures have. In any case, here you see all the contributors and you see a variety of ethnic groups. But if you limit yourselves to art historians by training, you see that the, the group is almost entirely white. And if you look at Renaissance historians, once again, 
It's a white ghetto. This is 2022. So there's certainly a need for more diversity in our field. And this lack of Blacks, people of African descent, people of color in general in Renaissance studies means that if you don't encounter them when you go to conferences or in your readings, then students feel that perhaps it's not my field. And scholars may feel instinctively that somehow this is not their story, which is very sad. In my own personal experience over the last 40 years, I, can I only know of two, literally two black scholars of the Italian Renaissance. Surely there are more, but I doubt it, because you don't always know the, the, gen the, uh, the, the race or gender of the people you're reading. But I doubt if there were very many more. One of them is a man named John Tom, uh, Turner. And a decade ago, he wrote this very interesting article called focusing on the blacks in a very well-known painting, The Last Judgment by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. And re remarkably, virtually no one had noticed or, or commented on the fact that there are two figures who are very clearly black on the Sistine Chapel in the Sistine Chapel on the altar wall. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it was a black scholar who brought attention to that. Bringing people of color to the field allows them to see things that others have overlooked, allow them to ask new questions. They enrich the field for all of us. And hopefully, slowly, they will also make all people, and not only white people feel that art history is a field where they too can enter and contribute. In this work, you see that Blacks are shown in a positive light. That is, that they're shown as Christians and they're being pulled up to heaven by rosary beads. It's a wonderful idea. Therefore, that is by prayer. And this idea of seeing Black figures in a positive light in Renaissance works is a theme that I myself discussed in a talk given right in this spot uh, two years ago, it was a week before lockdown, where I spoke about uh, Filipino Lippi's adoration of the Magi and the black figure here, or the dark skinned figure at least, um, who I argue is an African uh, who is seen as a man of respect and importance because he's coming to embrace the Christ child. That is, he's appreciated insofar as he's a Christian or will soon become a Christian. And that is uh, related to the theme that I'll be discussing in my talk this evening. But most discussions of black people in Renaissance art focus on the other side of the coin. That is on blacks that are shown in a derogatory or servile or negative light. And specifically on how black people appear as servants. Um, here's a very large painting by Paolo Veronese in the Louvre, the wedding at Cana, where you see a magnificent banquet with many uh, men and women in their rich clothing and jewels, and they're served in part by black men. Now, this video clip that you see here is actually a detail from a music video made by the Carters in 2018. And what they're evidently trying to express in apeshit is how they as black artists have a right to physically be in the museum. We have a place here. It's not just for white artists and white figures like the Mona Lisa, but this is our place too. Interestingly for me is that they chose to show an image of the black servant in the very same painting, there's also a image, very surprisingly, of a black man seated at the table. So as you can see, there's an African seated right next to a Venetian woman with, her, with all her jewels. We're not exactly sure who he is or why he's there, but certainly he has a place at the table. But that's not the aspect which neither the Carters nor the art historians normally focus on. Here's a painting by Filipino Lippi in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And just last year, I think, 
on their online uh, website where I took this blurb and also in the museum itself, physically on the wall, there's a discussion of slavery. And what they explain there is how starting in the 1460s, for the, for the first time, black scholars started, excuse me, um, black slaves started arriving in Florence. Before that, and throughout the Renaissance, there were white slaves, but the blacks started arriving in the 1460s. And not surprisingly, after we start having enslaved Africans in Florentine homes, you start seeing enslaved Africans in paintings that adorn Florentine homes. And here you see uh, there are three uh, women and two men in the background. More typically, uh, and very often, as in this painting of the Adoration of the Magi by Gillen Dio, exactly uh, the same date, that is from the 1480s, you see the three kings, the three wise men, are shown as white, but one of the pages, um, the attendant, is shown as a black boy in his fine, ro uh, colorful robes. And I suspect that in the Tornaboni home with this uh, painting, originally was hung, there was also a black uh, enslaved African um, who probably had clothing similar to this. North of the Alps, however, in Germany, where Albert Dürer worked and in Flanders, starting in the 1450s, we start finding the youngest king often is shown as a black man. That's discussed in this online exhibition on being present by Paul Kaplan in a wonderful entry. Paul Kaplan wrote a book on this in the 1980s, and it's been the subject that is the Black King has been the subject of two recent exhibitions, one at the Getty, and I'm pleased to say that the curator was a uh, graduate of the master's program here at Syracuse, Brian Keane, and also a show at the Walters Art Gallery in, uh, in Baltimore. So why have one of the kings is black? There are two main reasons. And first we have to go back to the story of who were the, the Magi. The Magi simply means wise man. And the main source, or I should say the original source is from the gospels, the, the, the book of Matthew. And it doesn't say very much. What we learn is that the king, when he learned that the Messiah was born or, or boy was born who was thought to be uh, the Messiah, there was a star. So many artists like Filipino included a star or orb in the upper part of the painting. And these three wise men who must have been astro astronomers or astrologers followed the star and they brought gifts. And the Bible says the gifts were gold, frankincense and myrrh. The fact there were three gifts led to the belief that there were three wise men, although the Bible doesn't say that. And often artists would show three different gifts, one being gold, held here by the Christ child, and the other two are containers holding the incense and the medicinal ointment, uh, which is made from myrrh. Still, if you are an artist who wants to depict the story or a theologian who wants to explain it, you don't get much out of this passage. But it was believed that the story could be enriched by another Old Testament passage in Isaiah. And here we're told that nations came to glorify your light, your being God, and kings came bringing the wealth of nations and they brought gold and frankincense. That's important because that allowed people to link this passage with the passage in Matthew leading to the view that, ah, those wise men must have been kings. So they're the same thing, the wise men are the kings. And importantly for my talk today is the middle passage where it says that they were accompanied by camels or they were brought by camels, which came from various regions, including Sheba. Many artists like Filipino here included camels, although most artists had never seen a camel. 
which leads to, to some rather strange looking camels in the paintings. And Sheba, people didn't really know where Sheba was, but it certainly wasn't in Europe. And according to the Renaissance and medieval view of the world, there were three land masses, Asia, Europe, and Africa, and therefore Sheba was believed to be in Africa. So the camels came from Africa, therefore one of the kings came from Africa, therefore there was a tradition of showing one of the kings, or at least one of the pages, as being African. But there's another reason why the Adoration of the Magi often includes a black king. And here we see, by the way, St. Augustine specifically saying that the Magi and the people who adored Christ came from the East, the West, the North, and the South. Well, if you're speaking in Europe, where South? South means Africa. And artists like Filipino would show uh, camels, as I said, also figures with exotic headgear, turbans, and this black man, which, as I mentioned before, all these figures refer to people who come from beyond Europe to adore the Christ child. But there was, as I was beginning to say, another reason why the youngest king was often shown as black. And that's because it was well known in the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, that in Ethiopia, there was, and still is to this day, a Christian community. It was actually begun in the fourth century. What they believed at the time, and here you see a Renaissance map, which says Ethiopia, and there is a black king there. On the right, you see a painting of this king, which is in Uffizi, and the inscription identifies him as Prester John. What you need to know is a widespread belief among people of all walks of life, including emperors and kings and popes, believed that this Prester John was a man, an African emperor of immense wealth and power. And so the Europeans were looking to him as their savior in their fight against Islam. It's rather remarkable today, the idea that the Europeans would look for hope and wealth and assistance and to be saved by an African. But that's how it worked. By the way, the entry on this painting is by Ingrid Greenfield, and she gave a talk on this here for Black History Month in 2018. One of my themes today is the importance of not only reading about these uh, biblical figures or these legendary rulers. I mean, there was, a, there was a king of Ethiopia, but he wasn't this man of enormous wealth and power. So it's one thing to read about them and to hear about them, another thing to actually physically see someone. And that's what happened in the 1440s when an Ethiopian delegation came to Florence and to Rome. And this was reflected not in a little old painting, but in a bronze relief on the door of St. Peter's. So the physical context, seeing, imagine people in Italy, most of them had never seen anyone from Africa and seeing these Christian Africans walking down the street, being welcomed by the Pope, it must have had an enormous impact on people's imagination. And it certainly had an impact on art. 20 years later, for the first time in Italy, we find a black magus appearing in an adoration of the Magi in this painting by Mantegna. But on the whole, the Florentines were not very interested in showing a black king. And as we've seen, most often they just have one of the pages as being black, but not the three kings themselves. This is a slide I showed a couple of years ago, talking about the first black magus in Florence, one is this painting rather by an obscure artist named Botticini in Chicago. And I found this photograph of another painting, a painting that was lost. And as it turns out, the lecture I gave a couple of years ago here, I turned it into an article. And when that article was in press last year, the painting came up for auction. Um, it was a bit too expensive for my budget, but I'm in contact with the person who owns it, who sent me this photograph. And you can see that it was very clearly the second king here, um, 
front in the front row, but given great prominence, is a black man. But what I want to turn today to a different painting. And this a little known but fascinating painting of the Adoration of the Magi from a century earlier, that is the generation of Giotto in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So you see some familiar elements here. There's the three kings, all three of them are white. They're holding gold and behind them, there are some strange looking camels. But obviously the reason why I'm showing it to you today is because in the foreground, very clearly, there are three black men with African features, not only the black skin tone and with what I'm told is authentic African attire probably Ethiopian attire. Why are they? Who are they? What are they doing here? Well, it was suggested by Paul, oh, I should say first that this panel is one of three, at least, maybe there are others. Um, these two are in France and they once had the coat of arms of the Anjou family, that is a royal French family. And these works may have been commissioned by the King of Naples, which is then under French domination of Robert of Anjou. So we call him an Italian artist, but he's actually working in south of France and in Naples, which was under French domination. It was suggested by Paul Kaplan, and I think uh, rightly so, that we can link these paintings with an actual visit to Italy of Christian. Uh, Africans. Now, this visit is little known, but an account was just published a couple of years ago that was written before 1330. This painting's 1340, so we're talking about the, rep, the same time. An account is written which said that a delegation of ambassadors from the emperor of the Christian Ethiopia, that is, ambassadors of Prester John came to Italy, they went to Avignon, looking for the Pope, they didn't find him there, so then they went to Rome. Now, probably they were not ambassadors, They're probably they were pilgrims, but the point is that they were thought to be ambassadors. These uh, medieval authors and artists saw an African. As amazing as this was in the mid 1400s, it must've been even more amazing in the early 1300s. And these Africans came to give homage to the Pope so if you're an artist, how do you reflect that? The artist shows these Africans who he must have actually seen because he has the facial types and the clothing accurately. He shows them together with kings giving homage to the Christ child. At least this is the hypothesis of a rather mysterious painting. As I said, over the following century and Subsequent centuries, a black king was popular in Germany and also in Flanders, uh, in the, the Flemish painting. This is a painting we'll come back to in a few minutes, but Flemish painting was also very important in Portugal. Well, why should we talk about that? Because of this amazing painting, which was in a cathedral in central Portugal. It's done in 1502, which is very early for the adoration of the Matra that we see here. Because if you look closely, you see that there are three kings, two of them are white. And the third one, he's not a black man, but the convention of having a figure who's non-European was changed to show an Amerindian. Now this painting was done just after, two years after Europeans had arrived for the first time in what is now known as Brazil. And the ships went, were led by a Portuguese admiral and his family came from the city where this uh, altarpiece was made. So there must be a link between this admiral and the commissioning of this work and specifically um, the depiction of, these, of this Amerindian. Specifically his feathered headdress and his weapon in his hand 
correspond to written descriptions that we have. But the man himself, if you look at him, he looks like a white man with brown skin. Why? Because the author hadn't seen an Amerindian. No one had seen an Amerindian, at least not from this area in Brazil. So the painter had heard about this. The physical contact with the Europeans led to the inclusion in the painting, but he didn't have the representation down right. Still, the contact with the Amerindians and the idea that the Amerindians were being converted to Christianity gave the brilliant idea for this artist of showing one of the kings is representing this new land of people who are adoring the Christ child. Well, just last month when I was talking to a colleague about this, um, this uh, project, I wasn't even talking to a colleague. I, I was posted this on a, on, a, on a Facebook site that I'm on. And I learned about this painting of which I know nothing. Uh, it's a German artist. Uh, it's in the paintings in the Louvre. But what's remarkable about it, and I'd love to find out more, is that the middle king here, if you look at his straight black hair, if you look at his facial features, he is based on an Amerindian. So this artist must have actually seen someone from the new world and included him in this painting following the same logic as the Portuguese one, but I don't think he saw the Portuguese one. I mean, um, it's a long way from central Portugal to Germany. On this theme, one more work, another remarkable painting, a century later in Peru. And the artist here, although he has a, a Spanish name, he's actually born in um, Brussels. And he became a Jesuit, that is a, matter, a member of the religious order that went to the New World and throughout the world in order to uh, advance the Christian cause. And Jesuits um, led conversions. They were instrumental in setting up schools. They gave sermons. And I think we could see the work of this artist as a sermon in art, the visual equivalent. And what he's saying in this work is that yes, there were three kings. He's continuing the tradition of having one of the kings as black, but he also shows one of the kings with a feather as an Amerindian. So, the th three different parts of the world, Europe, Africa, and the Americas are represented here in his painting. Also in the 1600s, um, I wanna stay in this time period a little bit longer, but I wanna come back to uh, Europe and specifically to Rome to tell you in brief, an unbelievable story of a man known in Europe as Nevunda, and he was an ambassador of the King of Congo. Now, as I only learned fairly recently, that the king or one of the kings of Congo converted to Christianity in the 1490s. That is in, uh, in the period uh, we in Italy refer to as the Renaissance. Ethiopia had uh, converted to Christianity in 400. This is a thousand years later. The popes uh, were fascinated by this fact uh, because this uh, indicated a whole new people who were converting to Christianity, who indicated the international uh, following of their religion. And they tried in vain to make up a direct contact between the king and the pope. Finally, over a century later, in 1604, the Congolese king sent an ambassador, a nobleman, uh, to Rome. His trip was long and arduous. It took four years. And in 1608, this Nevunda arrived in Rome. He arrived in January. And what you need to know is that traditionally, to this day, the arrival of the three magi is known as the epiphany, which takes place on January 6th. So the Pope realized that here we have a black king or, or an ambassador representative of a black king who is coming to Rome exactly at the right time for the epiphany. And here you see him being represented in a fresco, which is in the papal suite, uh, 
or, or was then Papal uh, Palace, the Quirinale. And in this engraving, and here's a couple of details. In the upper left-hand corner, you could see Nevunda kneeling, giving homage to the king, looking very much like an adoration of the Magi painting, uh, which is here. This is a scene which actually didn't take place. Because what happened is Nevunda was so sick when he arrived that he died a couple of days later. And this is true. This is the Pope going to the sick bed, of uh, deathbed as were, of Nevunda. So Nevunda died on January 5th. The next day, January 6th, that is the day of the Epiphany, the day when the three kings go to adore the Christ child, the Pope arranged this funerary procession that you see here, where this representative of the Black King was brought to the church of Santa Maria Maggiore, where there was and is to this day a very famous representation of the nativity. So the paintings of the Adoration of the Magi, which included a Black King, had an impact on how a real representative was seen, and he was literally physically inserted into this recreation of the epiphany. Moreover, the Pope commissioned this tomb, which is extremely expensive. It's in uh, polychrome marble. And this was placed in the church of Santa Maria Maggiore, where it still stands. And originally, now it's in the baptistry, but originally it was right across from this crash scene, this nativity scene, so that the Black King, or the representative of the Black King, the African King, would be looking at the Christ child. It's as if it's a adoration painting which came to life and was immortalized in sculpture. The last painting I want to look at in a little bit of depth is uh, closer in time to us and closer in culture to us. We're now in England in the 19th century. And this work by Burne Jones, which is a representative, he was one of the leaders of what's known as the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. These were artists who were tired and frustrated with the canonical status given the works of Raphael. And so they looked to artists who were working before Raphael, hence pre-Raphaelites, but also works who were artists who were working in a different tradition, Flemish paintings and Venetian paintings. We see this interest in a archaic style in the actual format. In the center, you see their adoration of the Magi in the left and right and Annunciation. This idea of a three panel altarpiece, a triptych is something which was uh, completely out of date for centuries in England and recalls Italian Renaissance 15th century models. And if we look in the center, we see uh, some familiar elements. There's a gold background. There are the three kings. Uh, there's some unfamiliar elements as well. I should say that today we often say, and accurately say, that the Pre-Raphaelites are part of the aesthetic movement. That is the movement that art exists for art's sake. Art shouldn't have any didactic purpose. The only way to judge work of art, the only value in art should have is if it's aesthetically pleasing, if it's beautiful. And that's certainly true for some artists, but not Burne Jones. Burne Jones began his uh, students when he was a college student, like, like most of you. He studied theology. He wanted to be a priest. And he continued to be a devout man and learned in the Bible and theological studies throughout his life. And specifically, a number of his paintings were the subject of sermons. And here the Reverend uh, Burns in an aptly named book called Sermons in Art interpreted this painting. And he interpreted the, Mar the Magi's quest, the Magi's journey as the soul's quest for God. Now the word quest, especially in England at that time, brought to mind the quest for the Holy Grail, the Knights of King Arthur. And this helps explain why here, unlike any other painting we've seen, one of the kings is shown as a knight. Now, of course, there were no Christian knights at the time. There were no Christians at all um, 
Christ has already been born. What Burne Jones is doing is taking this biblical story and making it real for his own time. Also by adding portraits, included his own self-portrait as one of the shepherds, his friend, the poet Swinburne, the painter and, uh, and uh, master of decorative arts, William Morris appears as the eldest king and his wife as Jane Morris. But of course, the reason why I chose this painting for my talk this evening is because of the third king, which I haven't yet discussed, the Black Magus. Now, this is not a portrait as far as we can tell. And rather, I think that this is an example of Burne Jones telling us that he's looking at paintings such as the Venetian paintings. Here's another work by Veronese, which is in Venice, which Burne Jones could have seen when he visited the city in the church of San Giovanni and Paolo. And a Flemish painting, because we know that Burne Jones and his uh, other members of the Brotherhood were very interested in the art of Flanders. This particular painting though, I don't think Burne Jones ever saw. And actually, I'm not sure if you and I were ever gonna be able to see it. The painting is in Kiev. As we speak, the city is being bombed. Here's what I read this morning. A statement from the um, CEO of the Getty Trust. Among the many atrocities being committed in Ukraine over the last few days of Putin's war, obviously there are worse tragedies than those happening to art, but still we're here talking about art today. And he said, Russian forces have begun deliberately to uh, burn to the ground, or that's destroying the Ukraine's cultural heritage. Russia has deliberately burned to ground a museum north of Kiev, which housed a precious Ukrainian folk art in what the Ukrainian scholars called an unfolding cultural catastrophe. And that's the museum. So this is a bit far from the topic where we began our lecture today, but there is a connection that I'd like you to, to, to reflect on. We've been talking about the need for physical contact, the need to have black scholars as art historians, black uh, curators, so that people could see them and feel that we're all part of the same world. We're talking about the impact of seeing Africans living Africans and how that transformed the artist's vision and the works of art they created. And that seems to me similar, comparable in a way to what's been happening the last few days with the president of the Ukraine. I mean, I don't know about you, I had vaguely heard of him, but he was just a name or title. But it was seeing him in these video clips. I haven't seen him in person, but still with, with the 2022 equivalent of personal contact, seeing someone move and talk. This is a video he made a, a couple of days ago, made him real to me and to people around the world. Maybe you've seen this very moving video he made the first day of the invasion where you know, he's in a t-shirt, he's unshaven, he's standing in front of a famous building in Ukraine doing a selfie, you can see his arm. And he's saying, we are here. We defend our state because our weapon is truth. The truth he's talking about in part is contrasting Putin who invented a manipulated story of the Ukraine in order to justify his attack. So what Zelensky is saying here is that we need to understand and embrace the truth. And that seems to be similar to the slogan of Black History Month, know the past, shape the future. Thank you.